huh, before it leaves. Going down to Mississippi. We boarded the Dark Queen, a twin-decked six-wheeler sternwheeler bound for New Orleans. Mississippi was famed for the luxury of her steamboats, but also for their unfortunate tendencies towards claustrophobic boiler explosions. I felt lucky, though, and quite certain that nothing ill would befall us on our journey to Crescent City. We were certainly due a good tur turn, were we not? Oh, brother. Nor Williamson has forged a more exclusive. Ooh. The common rooms and lounges of the Dark Queen were full of gamblers, enticing passengers into games of dice or cards. The river ports had been passing more and more regular, more and more regulation, and the cheap cheats and crooks had all fled the unregulated waters of the Mississippi to ply their trade. A fool and his money are soon parted, so the saying went. I had little pity to waste on fools, though. Monsieur Fogg clearly found the entire operation distasteful. Why did they deteriorate? Greetings, Captain. New Orleans to New York. New York to somewhere other than the American continent. I don't think so, friend. But now listen, do you play the trombone? I do. I think I'm starting a jazz band. New Orleans to Miami. New Orleans to Acapulco. Captain Latour was clearly quite cozy with the gamblers and had something of their attitude himself. I'll wager I can get us to New Orleans in three days rather than four, he shouted from the room at large. Who will take the wager? We could use an extra day, and Captain seemed quite sure of himself. A hundred pounds on it, I called. The captain whooped before loping off to the engine room. Watch over, my friends. You'll see a record made today. Please let nothing bad happen. Please let nothing bad happen. Please let nothing bad happen. I'm not going to get anything out of this. New Orleans to Atlanta. Going to Dallas. Our captain is arrogant, what did you think? Indeed he is. I'll play for his soul. Um, Atlanta. Atlanta to Marrakesh. Atlanta to the car. Ugh. Captain Latour ordered the Cali Calliope to play a tune as he mustered the crew and gave them the order to push the engines to their maximum limit. The coal shovelers scowled at the extra work involved, but the captain ignored them magnanimously. The Dark Queen's crew seemed competent enough, but as the spoilers whistled and screamed, the tip began to make an ominous keening noises. I offered to help shovel coal and shirt off my, to my shirt sleeves. Keep shoveling, Captain Latour shouted, tapping dials and muttering orders. He squeezed more oil into the engine crank. Will it be in New Orleans by sundown? Which was when, oh no, something began to make a screaming noise. I turned about, looking astern, seeing smoke issuing from a crack in the metal, and then it was too late. The rear boiler exploded. The entire ship seemed to shudder, and convulsed as the sailors screamed and wept and burned. It was hell, in the literal rather than metaphysical sense, and I was right in it. We did not reach New Orleans that day. Fudge! And I wonder if we ever would. None of the sailors died yesterday, though some no doubt wished they had. A much chastened Captain Latour moored the ship and organized boats to take them to doctors ashore. Monsieur Fogg and I were unharmed, at least physically, but there is no mu music or laughter on the Dark Queen's deck, and I do not think there will be in a long time. Queen continued her journey down the Mississippi, though, at a crawling pace. Captain Latour ordered only two of the five remaining boilers fired and had, an, had to offer double pay to the stokers to induce them. 
It is my fault. I confess to Mr. Fogg in English. I took his damn wage out. My master regarded me thoughtfully. Captain Latour took a gamble, and this time he lost. That is all. But you are a gambling man, I said, thinking of the screams of the sailors. I realize as much the very first day you took me into your service. What is the difference? There is none, Monsieur Fogg said calmly after a moment's consideration. I merely have a better calculation of the odds. We docked at New Orleans when the sun was low in the sky, glinting over the brackish water of the river and bathing the French and Spanish colonial villas in the city of the soft yellow light. <sighs> Seven days. Captain Latour came to see us off, bent back and almost gray as as he had to me my winnings of a hundred pounds. I think this wager has taught me caution, he said jiggly. Be wary of New Orleans. She's a city a man can abandon himself in. I took his money. It was a paltry sum, but perhaps it would be help him to remember his lesson. And we need it. Piedmont Airline from New Orleans was not, in fact, an airline at all, but, according to its advertisement, the fastest relay in America. Hardly a bold claim, considering there were only two truly significant lines in the continent, but nonetheless, it gave my master courage when we saw the slogan on the wall of the compartment. to London. Let us be an uneventful six days. We settled ourselves in a carriage with one other occupant, an extremely large man who intended himself, introduced himself as Charlie Sullivan, a lad from Br Birmingham. Uh, who was most impressively sculpted, especially around the neck and upper arms. His moustaches were nonetheless perfect. I asked where he was going, and he replied, New York. I was boxing. I'm home going home. You fought in a competition, I interp interp interpreted. There was an exhibition, he said. I won. Third round knockout. I gulped. However, Mr. Fogg's interest had been increasingly sharp, increasing sharply throughout the conversation. You are trained, he demanded keenly, or self-taught. I've got a manager, Sol Sullivan replied. He tells me what to hit. Excellent, excellent, Monsieur Fogg enthused. I want to hear all about it. I sat back and enjoyed the conversation. The details of boxing are more intricate than one might expect. And hearing the business of cut and thrust delivered in Sullivan's so very English tones was quite informative. Little did I know how the details I heard would come to be of use to me. Oh no, I think I've done this one before. Mr. Sullivan will, I think, go very far indeed, Mr. Mr. Fogg appinned as I brought him kippers from the dining hall. He seems to have the physique, I suggested. Not just the physique, the master replied. Physique is not the secret. His description of the transfer of weight from foot to foot is very well understood. So you are a, so you are a boxer, monsieur? I saw the shutters of his conversation beginning to come down. I went to school, yes. You mean you box as a child? He stiffened. The suggestion he had ever been a child was, I quickly saw, well beyond the pale, even for one as intimate as I. You should fight him, he said. I almost choked. It looked, he looked at me with surprise. Forgive me, it sounded as though you said I should fight, Mr. Sullivan. Indeed. He forked another forkful. You needn't be alarmed. I can teach you to box. I rolled back my sleeves. I am sure you can, monsieur, I replied, and I am a quick learner. 
or at least I thought somewhat confident in nature. Excellent, Monsieur Fogg put down his paper. I have arranged for a space in the god's van. Come on. When had he done this? I do not know. I merely followed, and there was a Sullivan, stripped to the waist, doing his warm-up exercises. Piss poor, too, he greeted me with a thick leather mount mouth guard. I all but burst into tears. Ha <laughs> ha I think I have done this part before, and I did not win. And we got stuck in New York, I believe. But still, I removed my own shirt and tried to listen as my master provided some pointers. And then the fight began. Sullivan was a tough opponent, and he chose to swing hard as he would brain me unless I defended myself. But he would not be able to slug on e every swing, and I would have to pick up my moments to attack. <sighs> to begin with, I kept my guard up. Matching Fogg's demonstration from th across the car... Just as Sullivan punched hard, the blow landed against my defense. I shook it off as best I could. A small crowd had gathered in to watch the fight, and they murmured with excitement. Strength and stamina are different, Monsieur Fogg called to me from the side. Your strength will come back if you swing lightly, but your stamina, once gone, will leave you out cold. I nodded to show I had heard. Sullivan's eye narrow. I kept my guard up once more, protecting my face while Sullivan made a quick jab. I caught the punch neatly. We were both still lively, although I was faring a little bit better. he was faring a little bit better than me. Watch it, the next swing may be hardy, my master called. Next, I kept my fists up once more, protecting my face. Sullivan lifted his defenses. We circled each other nervously. Neither of us was badly worn, though he was looking better than me. He still, he will have regained some muster from that block, my master shouted, so be warned. Then I kept my fists up one more, protecting my face, as Sullivan snapped his arms up to block. We circled each other nervously. We were both still energetic, although he was faring a little better than me. I heard rather than saw the money changing hands. Spectators were bat betting on me. I saw Sullivan's shoulders move back. He's making to block. Fog murmured, so don't swing too hard. Now is my turn. I jabbed. A quick decisive move while Sullivan brought up his block. I knocked him back a little. We were both still energetic, though he was looking better than me. I saw his arms tense. I raised my guard once more, protecting my face. Sullivan put up his defenses. We circled each other nervously. We were still both energetic. Blah, 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 blah. Next, I threw a light punch, a quick decisive move, just as Sullivan lifted his arms to block. I pushed him a little. We were both still energetic, though he was looking better than me. The crowd murmured and whispered. Sullivan's weight moved back. He's moving, making to swim, my master shouted. Then I got ready to duck and dodge, once more protecting my face. While Sullivan punched hard, I deflected the impact breathlessly. I was fading fast, and I could not take much more. Well done. He won't be able to swing like that again, my master shouted. Now is my turn. I threw a heavy punch, all my weight behind the blow. Sullivan delivered a stinging punch. I overpowered him, landing a sting. We were both all but equally matched, tiring but still eyeing each other warily. I raised my guard once more, protecting my face, just as Sullivan swung a blow. I dodged neatly. The fight was by no means settled. He lifted back his shoulders. Next, I jabbed. A quick decisive move, while Sullivan snacked up his block. I knocked his strength a bit. The betters were shouting with increased fervor, who would win? Then I raised my guard once more, protecting my face. Sullivan punched hard. The blow landed against my defense. He was tiring, certainly, but I was all but on my knees. Excellent. Now's the time to get him, my master shouted. Now is my turn. I threw a heavy punch, putting all my weight behind the blow, just as Sullivan brought up his defenses. I knocked him back a little. We were both staggling, stumbling around the ring, but he had the upper hand by a hair's breadth. I saw him shift up onto his tiptoes. I got ready to duck duck and dodge once more, protecting my face while Sullivan punched hard. I caught the punt neatly. This could not last much longer. We were both on our last reserves. Superb! Don't hold back, my master shouted. Next, I threw a heavy punch, putting all my weight behind the blow. Sullivan made a lightning uppercut. I burst through his attack, landing a sting. Sullivan span about and fell backwards onto the floor of the van, defeated. Oh my gosh, I did it! Oh. Generous hands scooped me up in the air. Excellent show, Monsieur Fogg beamed, displaying a violent burst of character. Most impressive! Sullivan was rubbing with his side of his head, and cursing in a version of English I did not recognize. I shook his hand as he was carried to a compartment to lie down. Whew. I believe this makes you lightweight champion of North America, Monsieur Fogg remarked to me. More to the point, we won a little from a wager or two. Two thousand pounds, in fact. We're going to need that. Oh, I was so elated. Oh my gosh, I can't believe I won that fight. Oh, we've got five days to make it to London. I awoke, still smarting from my boxing match with Sullivan, and my master most generously decided he would fetch breakfast. Oh, you are most kind, monsieur. Indeed, he replied. We cannot have you dropping the tray. He returned with black coffee and well-buttered toast. A most considerate choice to bring it to a Frenchman, or at least so I thought, until he began to eat the toast himself and drink the coffee in a sl slurp. We arrived in New York later that day. I struggled to lift the cases with my tired arms, and we staggered off the train.
lot more money to do that. So we may as well go to the bank. It opens on Monday. Bum. pocketed in, in New York, I seized the thief's hand still in my pocket. You tangled with the wrong Frenchman, I exclaimed in triumph. The little thief looked up at me with his thick, lashed eyes. I realized blat belatedly that the thief was a young girl, barely ten. I released my grip tightly and shook the opportunity to curse in a thick Irish absent, accent and bite me. I held on, despite the incon inconvenience, and finally she grinned at me, teeth stained with my pr precious life's blood. Oh, you done, little vampire. For now, the girl muttered. What's it to you? I looked down at my bloody arm. Truly, it was a sal salutary lesson not to let my guard down to strange climbs. I should report you. Her face even melted. Oh, please, sir, she said in all in innocence and politeness. Don't. <sighs> my time with Monsieur Fogg had left me strict and law-abiding, however, and I was not to be swayed by my mere fluttered eyelashes. Instead, dragging the urchin behind me, I located the police officer who guarded me with a curious but not entirely unfriendly expression, clearly unused to dealing with the more civilized people of Europe. And what's the matter with you, he said, escape from the circus. This girl tried to rob me, I declared. Well, looks like she wasn't very successful, the policeman replied. But you better let her go. Foreigners taking children away from something we Americans frown upon. I demanded justice, calling on the officer to remember his duty, his badge, invoking even the great statute that was at the very moment being prepared in my home country for their great harbor. Liberty, the officer interrupted, not justice. Get your facts straight and let the child go. And he wrestled the girl from my grasp, while the little actress gasped and sobbed and made a terrible scene. I demanded to see his commanding officer. And that, friends, is how I ended up spending the night in American jail, much to Mr. Fogg's irritation. Let's go to Reykjavik. Doesn't cost as much and it's leaving today, so here we go. The ice winds had a was the ice wind was a pendul pendulously large Savakar atomic, oh my gosh, that wanted to fly four or five miles high and had to be hauled down to the, to the docks by a team of thirty to forty steam winches. It seemed large for a ship traveling to Iceland, but I was informed by a dockhand that most of the space was for cargo, not people. Indeed, space was at such a premium, passengers were allowed no luggage. I had spied the word quarantine on the visa document we had signed, and I felt there was some important facts we were not being told. But still, we had bought our tickets, signed our visa forms, and discarded our luggage. It was soon time to depart. Conditions about the ice wind were comfortable enough for the 30 or so passengers making the trip. We quickly knew everybody by their Christian name, and Monsieur Fogg had found himself a capable whist partner to pass the hours. Though this close to London, I could see he was not quite as focused on his game as he might normally have been. Evening crept in on us slowly as we headed north. It was day 76, and we had barely 100 hours remaining to return home. I know, I know, I know, I know. days. We have passed the latitude of London, Monsieur Fogg declared, and I wonder if I could detect sadness in his tone. Perhaps even he was homesick. We had, after all, been on the longest journey imaginable, and by some measure we were, were as far from home as, pos as it was possible to be. I suggested trying to bribe a crew, crew to fly due east, and Monsieur Fogg nodded, a worthwhile thing to attempt. I went to befriend the crew, but found they were rather suspicious of me. 
You don't look like a working type, one woman remarked. You looked well to do. I am a valet, I declared. See, I don't even know what that is, she replied. Good day to you. I turned to Mr. Fogg, mission unaccomplished, and he shrugged. No matter, we were making good time, but I could see the impatience in his eyes. The third day was short, and we arrived in the skies above Reykjavik as the sun was gathering across the water. From the wheel, I could see more smaller ships bobbing above the docks. At least one of them would be bound for London and for home. As we landed, I looked back, hoping to catch a sight of our mysterious cargo being unloaded. As I watched, the whole nose of the craft was attached, and something was dragged out from a team of steam carts with winches. Whatever the item was, it was the size of the airship itself, and covered with a thick tarpa tarpaulin, lashed securely with belts and chains. It was hustled onto a wide gauge train, which puffed away to deliver it elsewhere. Indeed, a puzzle. Reykjavik was a quiet town with few inhabitants, but still had the feeling of a bustling center of commerce. The flag of the Kingdom of Denmark fluttered above the trade hall, declaring this place an outpost. But of all the outposts, colonies, and adjuncts of great nations we had seen, it seemed the most comfortable in its skin. The comfort most likely derived from the natural hot springs which we tried out in an out open area behind a fine fish restaurant. Monsieur Fogg sat at one end and myself at the other, and we breathed in gulps of steam with a deep, satisfying sigh. They should visit us in Hyde Park, I exclaimed. Monsieur Fogg shook his head. I think they are heated from underground thermos, he replied. In London they would require coal, but in London there are better uses. I do believe it was the first time I heard him say, even in a roundabout fashion, that any place had its own elements of value. day. We passed an anxious night with our 80-day deadline looming. Every sunset seemed to carry extra weight. And we made ourselves comfortable for the night and I attended to Monsieur Fogg. Let's depart. Come on, we can do this. The Silver Seal was a smaller ship than the Ice Wind had been and a gig to boot. How long will it take? I asked the captain was reported. Three days, he replied. Can't be done any faster. Three days seemed like a very long time, and I could see from Mr. Fogg's expression that he thought much as well. <sighs> we were so close. The ocean tore along beneath us, so I enjoyed talking to no one. There was nothing I needed to know, no one to charm, flatter or beguile to, into giving us aid. There was only the wind and the time, and we could control neither. Monsieur Fogg looked out the, of the observation deck windows with perfect calm, as though we as though we were not, with every passing moment, drawing closer and closer to London. My nerves were in shreds, and I was nearly chewing the rails with anticipation. I spent the remaining time... We're not going to make it in two hours. Shoot. Watching every possible danger, one eye on the crew, the other on the ship, ready to react to the slightest trouble, but nothing broke the peacefulness of our day. As we lay down in sleep, Monsieur Fogg murmured, Today is day 80, Passport We have failed. Do not lose heart, I advised him. Indeed not, he agreed. Agreed, we must still return home and as fast as possible. We were only a few hours short. We tethered at the airship dock in Hyde Park and felt for the first time in 81 days the feel of English soil under our soles. Shoes. At long last, we returned to London. Ugh, oh, one day! One day! I hailed one of the steam engine carriages idling in the base of the servant in the high park. To the reform club, I instructed my master shook his head to severe roll, he corrected calmly, and turned his face to the window. I have most assuredly lost my wager. Soot and fog thickened to the yellow light as the gas lamps as we drove through the streets of London. I 
think I only truly grasped matter, the truth of the matter then, hearing the words of my master's uninflicted tones. We had lost the wager, and by a scant few days at that. One day! One day! I replayed the journey in my mind, stealing a few hours here and there. It galled to me that to come so punishingly close and still fail. My master entered his domicile with his habitual tranquility, though he instructed me to leave the windows shut up so that the neighbors would not mark his return. I prepared his supper, and he ate heartily, as if he were utterly, not utterly ruined. Past Porto, he began, Oui, Monsieur Fogg, in the silence that followed, I counted up. The hair's breadth escapes, all the obstacles which we had overcome, and those which had delayed us. You have performed, you have performed your duties with competence and skill, Pas he said, as though remarking upon the weather. But more importantly, you have circumnavigated the globe as my companion, despite the unfortunate protraction of our journey, he added, which was no small feat. And what will you do now, monsieur? I asked, trying to emulate my master's coolness and aplomb. My course, Passporto, Monsieur Fogg interjected smoothly, is fully decided upon. We must attempt the journey around the world once more. Once more? I cried. Indeed, Monsieur Fogg said impl implacable. implacably, an intent light glinting in his cold blue eyes. This time, forewarned and better prepared, we will succeed. Oui, Monsieur, I nodded smartly. Monsieur Fogg considered his letter and tapped his pen. Perhaps this time he said more th thoughtfully and more directly. Oh. Fogg blamed sinking airship off the coast of Singapore, towing the city paddles to Berlin, the American train, 81 days journey. We're so close, you guys. At least I'm dependable. I'm collected, and I'm remarkable valet. Comfortable relationship with Fog. Ugh. And that is 80 days. Oh, it's a pretty fun game. I wish I was better at it. To come so impossibly close. Oh, one day. Oh, to think of all the different options I could have taken and what I should have done. And I believe there's actually a way to go the opposite way around the world. Like... Like, instead of going across Europe and then Asia and then across the Pacific, across America and across the Atlantic Ocean, you can go across the Atlantic Ocean, across the U.S., across the Pacific, and then across, you know, the other way, the opposite way that we went. So, who knows, perhaps I'll play this again in someday, but for now, I think I'm done. <laughs> it was an exciting adventure around the world. And I look forward to doing another one, maybe someday soon. Thanks, everybody, for watching. <laughs>